Good morning to all my friends, data scientists, analysts, epidemiologists, biostatisticians, bioinformatics, so on and so forth, and all walks of life just the same. Good morning. It is 2.16 a.m. What are we looking at to start off with? To start off, we were looking at the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting Data System. Keep in mind, I'm going to start having this caveat. We'll go into that in a second. And the new connection, the Bell's Palsy. So this is reported cases to the various system up to today, uh, sorry, not up today, up to July 16th. And there is our average age. I want to get back to this in a second. But first, we're going to get a couple different things. Number one, this wonderful article from, I believe it is Emergency Medicine and Public Health Preparedness. Let's just validate just to make certain. Uh, sorry. Please forgive me. Disaster medicine and public health preparedness. What we're going to do is draw a parallel between the swine flu, not swine flu, Spanish flu. That was 1970s. Uh, and basically 1918 influenza. And this is give you a few little bit of perspective. And that's what we'll be dealing with quite a bit uh, in this basically research segment is perspective. So if we look at the 1918 influenza. We're looking at 6,136 deaths per million. 2020 COVID-19, 1,878. But here's the caveat, or I should say the catch. The average mortality during the 1918 influenza was t age of 28, or the mean. The average mort age of mortality, or the mean of mortality in 2020 COVID-19, I believe was 75. And that is what results in the side note here. And this is going to be fairly pertinent that was proceed forward. The calculated drop in US life expectancy from COVID-19 for the first half of 2020 was one year. That for the 1918 pandemic was almost 12 years. And we will return to this in a little bit, but I want you to get that information out ahead of time. Also, next, we're going to make a quick brief uh, side trip down to looking at the Delta variant primary reason why and this is going to play into this article here believe it or not we are going to look at this right here indian delta variant surge projected to peak in the mid-october and cause up to 240,000 deaths and 240,000 infections and 4,000 deaths per day if current vaccination rates stay the same oh by the way it is now july 25th at 2 19 a.m so it is later early from that perspective this article was July 24th. So as you can see right there, da, 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 so to say. So what they're doing is a worst case scenario projection of 4,000 deaths per day. Is that the right thing to do as far as credible reporting when you're looking at basically a very, very remote, if not albeit virtually impossible outcome based upon the current circumstances? Is it right to keep on doing this to people? 4,000 deaths per day, 240,000 infections per day. All right, let me give you a little perspective into the Delta variant. And uh, also to fact individual, I don't like using the word fact checkers because it sounds so blasé, but peers which like to make sure that everything is credible. Our first information source we're gonna be utilizing is our world and data. Now, here we go. Now, our world and data is maintained by Oxford University for those not familiar. So basically, or and others too on top of that, the share of SARS-CoV-2 sequences that are Delta variant. We are looking at India and the United States. So there you have India. India is at now 100%. If we follow the x-axis a little further in the United States, 88.77%. So exactly in at least the case of India, how, uh, I would say no, not nefarious, how much impact has it had in India in a negative uh, context? Let us begin. So that's the Delta variant. Confirmed cases. Right, here we go. India has about, let's say, 27.56 confirmed cases under the shadow of the Delta variant compared to the United States, which is at 149 or a little higher than that, 155.43. And please keep in mind, cases per million. All right, let's look at confirmed deaths and every life's important. But however, though, we are going to look at the comparison here. 
confirmed deaths from India is at about 0.72 per million. United States is 0.76. Now there is the Delta variant. Now, how pertinent is vaccination? As we return back to this article, if vaccination rates stay the same. Now this is an observational, uh, we're looking at this as an observation and not only an observation. So is this uh, an appropriate thing to say after we review the next piece of information? What is the percentage of fully vaccinated individuals in India? We looked at the confirmed deaths. We looked at the confirmed cases. People fully vaccinated. Yes, you see the difference there? India is about 6.60%, 6.66%. United States, 48.66%. Yet, the outcome under the shadow of the Delta variant is again as follows, just to reiterate, India about 100%, at about 100%, at 100%, at least the only one detected at this point in time. Confirmed deaths, virtually about the same per million for the United States. Confirmed cases, quite substantially lower compared to the United States as far as confirmed cases under the shadow of the Delta variant. So when you see articles like this, is that responsible reporting? Is that truly responsible reporting? Knowing how people have been traumatized for so long in reference to that. Is that even is that even cool? Is that reporting at all? Or is that some sort of convoluted form of infotainment? Because observationally on a global scale, that really erodes credibility, per se, in our mainstay institutions in reference to trust information and not being contaminated by bureaucratic propaganda. So that's just to give you a little bit of insight. Again, any of you can go to Our World and Data and it's a wonderful site and you can play with the Explorer on your own just to validate, especially those individuals which are tasked with fact checking. Now we're going to go into that in a second. Now first, before we get to this aspect, let's go into the studies that we are going to cover. We are going to be covering as follows, patient case strongly suggests links between COVID-19 vaccine and Bell's palsy. Oh, we're going to be covering a conspiracy theory real fast. We're going to get it out of the way. I'm going to move that right over here for a reason. All right, and we're going to come, we'll start with this. You're going to get a kick out of this. All right, next, natto extract. Let's back this up one. Natto extract digests, well, let's put it this way. Traditional Japanese food may hold building blocks of COVID-19 treatments. Extremely, extremely promising research. Uh, how readily does COVID-19 spread on school buses? Uh, the CDC study in reference to uh, mask and influenza transmission. Existing drugs to inhibit SARS-CoV-2. This is an incredible study. Uh, COVID-19 antibodies persist at least nine months or more after infection. Uh, this is the study that we looked at from the Society for Disaster Medicine and Public Health, which we alluded to a few seconds ago right here. And we're going to read some excerpts from that. Long COVID and Epstein-Barr virus reactivation. The percentage of people which are infected with COVID, you may be quite surprised, is how many people do you think have latent Epstein-Barr virus in their system? If you could read that there, I'm sure you already get the hint. And then we go to doctors, I mean, not the dentists, and reference to natural immunity and reference to the... Uh, or natural resistance to infection, I should say, in reference to SARS-CoV-2. Uh, desensitization, we're becoming desensitized to fear. And the objective here is how to get us more motivated again uh, through, through resensitization to fear, but for our own good, according to the research. Not my opinion, but I want to give you an idea to the insights and in how we are socially engineered uh, to create a sense of urgency. So if you're feeling anxious for reasons you can't quite explain, uh, fear-based health messages, is that really a healthy thing over an entire year? Um, study shows why a second dose of COVID-19 vaccine shouldn't be skipped. Now keep in mind, uh, whether you're pro-vaccine, anti-vaccine, whatever it is, this is a wonderful, wonderful study. 
in the excitement in reference to research. And they say things which are quite insightful, but still just the same. Its innocence is really, really cherishable. All right. And then we'll proceed forward throughout our information sources, per se. All right. Healthdata.gov. Outbreak Info uh, is one of our information sources and obviously our world and data and the VARES data set. We're going to cover this uh, basically a little bit right before we uh, go into the uh, data. And I'm going to do this because the fact checkers put a fact label on one of my videos. But after discussing with them, they removed the uh, warning label in reference to referencing VARES. And they were quite nice. And But however, they're just the same. I'm going to make, take a little extra effort to uh, explain that the vaccine adverse event reports are basically just safety signals. They have to be confirmed. And all because they are reported doesn't mean they're verified as of yet. But I want to have the disclaimer up there because I'm being fact checked more and more often. And we're not having any problem with the fact checkers. They, they sometimes they'll tag it, but then we discuss it and the tag is removed. All right, so let's begin with the first research article as oh, for, as I promised. There is an issue that goes around quite a bit in reference to, and I'm going to go to the uh, article right off the bat, in reference to basically microchips being put in vaccines and injected. I don't know how that got a hold. No, you know, what, you know what? I take that back. I know exactly how it it became mainstream. One is, remember the angel chip back during the SARS Hu Vidash 1 epidemic? And that was discussed back then, just it correlated at the exact same time uh, of SARS Hu Vidash 1. And of course, here we are today with SARS Hu Vidash 2 about the microchipping. But I want to give you a little bit of insight in reference to how advanced technology is. So if we can get past this potential uh, conspiracy, it doesn't mean conspiracy. I want to use conspiracy theory. I don't talk about it, obviously being wrong. Obviously, you know, suspension of civil liberties and everything else like that, which would have been considered a conspiracy a few years ago, obviously uh, manifested itself in quite well into this reality. But here we go. Artificial emotional intelligence, a safer, smarter future with 5G and emotion recognition. And this will give you a little bit of insight because I want to get this gone. Uh, but it doesn't mean it's any less scary. So if you begin, ready, here we go. Emotions are a critical characteristic of human beings and, se and separates humans from machines, defining daily human activity. However, such emotions can also disrupt the normal functioning of a society and put people's lives in danger, such as those of an unstable driver. Driver. Emotion detection technology thus has great potential for recognizing any disruptive emotion. And in tandem with 5G and beyond 5G communication, because we're already heading towards 6G, warning others of potential dangers. The virtue, they don't have to do a chip, they don't have to be magnetized, you don't have to do any of that. So again, to proceed. The virtual emotion system developed, and these guys are, are brilliant, and I'll tell you quite honestly, technology is probably two steps ahead Right now, for our imagination, we're discovering new things that we didn't even know existed, and now we're trying to go work backwards and go see how we can incorporate it into uh, our, you know, our current situation. By Professor Kim's team, called 5G IV Mosis, it can recognize at least five kinds of emotion. Again, from a distance, joy, pleasure. And this was back in February, and I guarantee. Yeah, February. And I guarantee our technology has proceeded far beyond that by now. Joy, pleasure, a neural state, sadness, and anger. I don't know what a neural state means. Maybe meditation. And it's composed of three subsystems dealing with detection, flow, and mapping of human emotions. The system concerned with detection is called Artificial Intelligence Virtual Emotion Barrier, or AI, VimaBar, I believe which relies on the reflection of wireless signals. Are you ready? This is why you don't need a chip. This is why you don't need magnets, people being magnetized and so on and so forth. Just to give you an insight into how scary technology has become. Relies on the reflection of wireless signals from a human subject to detect emotions. So it bounces the signals off of you. 
The emotion information is then handled by a system concerned with the flow called artificial intelligent virtual emotion flow, or AVMO flow, All right. which enables the flow of specific emotion information at a specific time to a specific area. Finally, the artificial intelligent virtual emotion map, or AIVMO map, utilizes a large number of virtual emotion data to create a virtual emotion map that can be utilized for threat detection and crime prevention. Do I have to reiterate that? A notable advantage of 5G IV MOSIS is that it allows emotion detection without revealing the face or other private parts of the subjects, which obviously the inverse of that means is you can reveal the face of private parts of the subjects just by bouncing 5G signals off of the individual thereby protecting the privacy of citizens in public areas. Moreover, in private areas, I don't know if it means the private parts of private areas, notice how that correlates uh, in reference to the paragraph, it gives the user the choice to remain anonymous while providing information to the system. I don't know exactly how anonymous, but still, technology is interesting. Furthermore, when a serious emotion such as anger or fear is detected in a public area, the information is rapidly conveyed to the nearest police department or relative entities who can then take steps to prevent any potential crime or terrorism threats. So, when it comes to needing a chip or magnetizing an individual in order to read emotions or a person's intentions, we're way, 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 way beyond that. Just food for thought. All right, next, let's get right into the data as follows again. All right, so I got fact-checked by these individuals here, uh, lead stories. But however, though, they were cool. They removed the tag. Again, if you get fact-checked and you have your information set and you have your you know P's and Q's in place, you're going to be okay. And however, though, I wanted to start with the caveat before the data sets, this right there, but we'll cover that once again in a second. Next, patient case strongly suggests link between COVID-19 vaccine and Bell's palsy. In fact, I want to go to the data set real fast. So keep in mind, this is the caveat. These are correlations, not causations. These are self-reports that need to be identified. And when they do identify them or whatever it is, the data is usually not for public uh, privy uh, right off the bat. And just consider no more than looking for patterns of adverse events. And it has to be confirmed. But however, though, man, we got a ton of patterns. Are you ready? Pattern number one. ba 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 ba, -ba. Reporter Bell's palsy reactions by age needs verification. So if we look at the database so far as of the beginning of January 1st, 2021 uh, to July 16th, we're looking at 1,636 unverified reports so far to the various system of Bell's palsy. Average age or median age, we have a few outliers there, is about 56. So that is may actually play a role, and it seems to be indifferent in reference to the type of vaccine. So it does play across the board. So basically, go into that story. It says, single episodes of unilateral facial nerve palsies were reported in the initial clinical trial of three major COVID-19 vaccines approved for use in the UK. All right, we won't go through it again. In phase three trials, which is something I did not hear about. Did you hear about that? Because I didn't hear about it. Four cases of facial palsy of unknown cause. Obviously, we're getting to that cause, potentially. Were reported and volunteers received that the version of vaccine, so on and so forth, the Moderna as well, and as well as the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. So all three vaccines, even though two vaccines are similar and one is not, one's an adenovirus vaccine, the other two are mRNA, still seem to have a same outcome in reference to uh, a vulnerability to uh, the reaction potentially of Bell's palsy, which is interesting because you have to look at the common denominator between the vaccines and then work your way backwards. Hint, hint. All right, next article. Are you ready? Ba, ba, ba. And there we go. Traditional Japanese food may hold building blocks of COVID-19 treatments. This is amazing. Again, with epidemiology, when you look at the caseloads in reference to Japan and China and Taiwan and South Korea, it is really low. Now, I was regretting epidemiology as far as looking at the diet from everything from fermented foods, lychee for the hesperidin, kirsten content, green tea, you know, everything we've gone through over 41 weeks of these videos. And now we have natokinase. And 
as a potential uh, mitigator, mitigating factor in reference to SARS-CoV-2. But the cool thing about NATO, now keep in mind, the study was done in vitro, not in vivo, in vitro, meaning not in a living organism. All right, so we have to wait till it's actually carried out in humans to make sure, or animals, or whatever it is, to get a good idea. Uh, but in individuals, for example, the world's population age 65 or older, NATO was previously found to be a diet staple in those who are least likely to die. That's an interesting way of putting it. From stroke or cardiac disease. Now, researchers have found that extracts made from the sticky, strong smelling NATO may inhibit the ability of the virus that causes COVID 19 to infect cells. To proceed forward. In this study, quoting, we investigated nano's antiviral effects on SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, and bovine uh, herpes virus, which causes respiratory disease in cattle. I don't know the exact reason why they did both of those, uh, but still just the same. Now, I, well, take that back, because guess what? Let's go back to the database again. Guess what? Another uh, reported uh, reaction to the various databases. Shingles. 7,681 cases or reports that need verification. Median age right there. So maybe there is a reason for that. I don't know. I don't know. But here we go. It says, in this study we investigated at Don, the researcher prepared two natto extracts from the food, one with heat and one without. This is an important uh, distinction. When treated with the natto extract made without heat, without heat, both SARS-CoV-2 and obviously our bovine virus, lost the ability to infect cells. However, neither virus appeared to be affected when heat treated natto, was, or the natto was heat treated. Quote, we found what appears to be a protease and proteases, proteins that metabolize other proteins. In the natto, extract directly digests receptor binding domain on the spike protein in SARS-CoV-2. I am going to reiterate that. The natto extract directly digests the receptor binding domain on the spike protein in the SARS-CoV-2. Albeit, not a living organism yet. It has to be carried out to see if it does the same thing. Maybe it does. Uh, noting that the protease appears to break down in heat, losing the ability to digest proteins and let the virus remain infectious. So if a so-called researcher was going to conduct research in living subjects, they would use natto that's not heated, would they not? We also confirm that natto extracts the same digestive effects on the receptor binding proteins of the SARS-CoV-2 mutated strain. Strange. Again, it's 2.38 a.m. right there. So, such as the alpha variant. The work may offer a big hint for such pharmaceutical design, or maybe for just the average individual that wants to uh, include natto in their diet when it's cold and maybe not as smelly. But see, that's an interesting aspect because the natto uh, seemed to have a very similar effect on mutated strains. And again, emergency use authorization and for vaccines to be utilized means there cannot be an alternative treatment so once there's an alternative treatment, uh, before, if, uh, let's say before the FDA approves any of these vaccines, then emergency use authorization is no longer justified. So again, I always worry about the incentive of, you know, pushing the vaccine too much, i.e. terrifying people, uh, when there have been plenty of research in, in reference to potentially incredibly effective and wide-ranging therapeutic agents out there which have just tremendous impact on very positive outcomes in combating SARS-CoV-2. Is that a lot of words? Yeah, I guess I think it is, and there's a reason why. But here we go, next one. How readily does COVID-19 spread on school buses? All right, let's just cut right to the chase. Universal testing and contact tracing revealed no transmission linked to bus transportation. For the study, the school monitored 1,154 students with asymptomatic PCR testing every two weeks initially and later every week from August 28, 2020 to March 19, 2021. During the highest community transmission, 15 buses served 462 students while operating at near capacity of two students in every seat. How they did this? I guess they'd sit very far apart. Do you really think that each student stayed two and a half feet apart from each other on a school bus. 
for that period of time. Universal masking when the mask on continuously and simple ventilation techniques, which just probably means the windows of the bus are open, possibly freezing the students to death, but just the same. Universal testing and contract tracing revealed no transmission linked to bus transportation. Even a few became positive, uh, but it wasn't linked to the bus transportation. Now, this leads into the story. Remember we did a story a few weeks ago in reference to CO2 buildup in young children after three minutes of mask wearing? Well, that story was retracted. But however, though, it caused an outpouring of other researchers who said, all right, that's fine. That's three minutes. Well, what about when students wear a mask for six to eight hours? Didn't mean it was not proven to produce high CO2 levels in three minutes, meaning that other peer peers had additional questions because the study was so controversial in light of everything that was going on, they wanted to make sure all the P's and Q's are in place. So until that information can be ascertained and clarified, they wanted to play it safe and retract the study uh, as opposed to possibly any negative outcome if the study did not prove right. But just the same. One of the studies that that study on the mask and the CO2 quoted was this one. And this is important because you have to know what the CDC actually does do. And are you ready? CDC Centers for Disease Control at May 2020, real important time because that was beginning of the pandemic. Non-pharmaceutical measures of pandemic influenza in non-healthcare settings, personal protective environmental measures. Remember they were saying at that time, Oh, we will always work with the best information we have available. Let's see what information they actually did have available. Are you ready? Although mechanistic studies support the potential effect, meaning, you know, one person wearing a mask in a lab setting for five minutes and sneezes and then they go home and they measure the projection of the saliva and a lot of the fun stuff. Uh, but how about the real world? Effective hand hygiene on face mask. Evidence from 14 randomized controlled trials of these measures that did not, and I reiterate, did not reiterate the word of the night. A substantial effect on transmission laboratory confirmed influenza. We similarly found limited evidence on the effectiveness of improved hygiene and environmental cleaning. We identified several major known gaps requiring further research, most fundamentally an improved characterization, characterization, characterization of the modes of a person to person transmission. Do, 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 do. Let's skip ahead. In our systematic, I want to say systemic, because I've been reading other things. Review, we identified 10 randomized controlled trials that reported estimates of effectiveness of face mask in reducing laboratory confirmed influenza virus infections in the community from literature published during 1946 to July 27, 2018. In pool analysis, we found no significant reduction in influenza transmission with the use of face masks. Now you may say, well, it's apples and oranges. Now what we're really working on is we're looking at the micron size, which I believe the micron size originally was thought being much larger. But however, though, it's not. I think it's fairly comparable. Uh, if someone could clarify for me, that'd be great. Uh, but otherwise, that's why they used influenza as a test case. But to proceed, disposable medical mask, also known as surgical mask, because remember people also saying, oh, people are not getting the flu because the masks. You see how that type of a weird thing, convoluted idea came around. Obviously, that was not shown to be the case from 1946 to 2018. But however, though, for expediency and virtue signaling, I guess it sounded like a good thing. But we're going to get to that in a second, too. Loose-fitting devices that were designed to be worn medical personnel protect accidental protect accidental contamination of patients' wounds. That's what it's there for. And to protect the wearer against splashes or sprays of body fluids. There is limited evidence for their effectiveness in preventing influenza virus transmission either when worn by the infected individual or person for source control or when worn by uninfected persons to reduce exposure. Our systematic review found no scientific effect, scientific effect. Well, that too. Significant effect of face masks on transmission of laboratory-confirmed influenza. CDC. Again, that plays into the bus thing and the school and everything else like that. And the war on any sort of thought that basically um, counters the overriding public uh, sentiment. And so, but there is plenty of information out there and plenty of really good studies out there. 
uh, for example, as from the CDC, uh, question in that effect of reference to the mask. And the only reason I bring this up is because it's risk benefit uh, analysis. If you're willing to, if, if, for example, let's say that study does pan out that high levels of CO2 do build up the mass, let's say it's not even three minutes, let's say it's three hours, that can have an extremely uh, a corrosive effect potentially on development uh, issues uh, outside of just general health issues like dysbiosis and things like that. So uh, the CDC documentation should play a role in there and the selection bias in avoiding the main studies and going into individual mechanistic studies is quite uh, not good. All right, let's proceed forward. And this all links will be there too in the YouTube video. Uh, existing drug is shown to inhibit SARS-CoV-2. Now, before we go on to that, I want to go into this one, uh, this one paragraph right here. I believe it's called Masinitib. 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 It's currently only approved to treat mast cell tumors in dogs. It has undergone human clinical trials for several diseases, including melanoma, Alzheimer's disease, multiple sclerosis, which, by the way, means many scars, and asthma. It has been shown to be safe in humans, but this does cause side effects, including gastrointestinal disorders and edema, and could potentially raise a patient's risk for heart disease. Now, we're not talking about taking it every day. If you look at the researcher's outcome, they're looking at the first sign or basically first exposure. But to proceed, 1900 clinical trial safe drug, 1900 clinically safe drugs against OCR43, a coronavirus that caused the common cold and can be studied under regular biosafety conditions. That's what they use. The drug specifically binds to the 3CL protease. There's that word again, which that word protease also came up with NATO. Remember? And so here we go from the protease once again. See, it's interesting how this connection uh, begins to start coming out more and more. Also, too, remember, the next generation of vaccines that may actually do better. I was about to say work, but do better. Uh, we're going to be focusing more on this as well, too. But to proceed, it says, next to research work with peers at the University of Louisville to test the drug in a mouse model. They found it reduced the SARS-CoV-2 viral load by more than 99% and reduced inflammatory cytokine levels in mice. But that's not the best part. Here we go again. They also tested in cell cultures, meaning in vitro, against three SARS-CoV-2 variants, alpha, beta, and gamma, and found that it worked equally well against them since it binds to the protease and not to the surface of the virus. <gasps> wow. Now imagine if this drug was actually panned out and was effective for uh, living individuals. Uh, can you imagine taking a medication like this and combining with the food like this? Since they both seem to work exactly on the same sites. Is that like amazing or what? We found that what appears to be protease or protease is proteins metabolize other proteins in the natto extract or directly digest the receptor binding domain on the spike protein in SARS-CoV-2. And then you go, boom, boom, boom. It says, this goes, it worked equally against them. It binds the protease, not the surface of the virus. Now, the team is working with a pharmaceutical company to develop the drug, AB Science, I keep it thinking AB testing, to tweak the drug to make it even more effective antiviral. Meanwhile, mesitinib, mesitinib, itself can be taken to human clinical trials in the future to test as COVID-19 treatment. That's the kind of stuff like to see rushed and just not rushed recklessly, but how would you say proceed at a more rapid pace in studies? Because again, a lot of these medications are great in the product that we gambled so much on vaccines working for all variants. And obviously the effectiveness is not anywhere near as uh, what we expected we or they expected and so by gambling and putting all your all your eggs in one basket you know that was not exactly wise where if we basically tried to complement it with some sort of other prophylactic whether it be from food or whatever or medication that would have been a nice play but no we gambled everything on just vaccines and some sort of draconian pandemic measures, which don't seem to really have any impact on anything. But to proceed forward. Da, 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 da. COVID-19 antibody persistently signed months after infection. Again, another study to basically reinforce that natural. And remember, again, in the beginning, they said, oh, there's no natural immunity that builds up to this. Da, 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 da. But 
obviously that's been shown not true. Uh, and T cell development, antibodies, and so on and so forth. Now, the weird part about it, remember, uh, a lot of the vaccine trials, the antibody levels decrease pretty fast, sometimes as, as fast as three months. Uh, that needs to be validated, but however, though, in the studies and the observations, it seems to be heading that route. But natural infection, they found as follows. The team found that 98.8% of people infected in February March showed detectable levels of antibodies in November, and there uh, was no difference between people who had suffered symptoms of COVID-19 and those that had been symptom-free. Now, remember all the tests that we do and we see these cases rise and how many people are asymptomatic? This is something new to me, that they could still develop the antibodies and actually be symptom-free as well. And this is an int interesting twist as well, too. The team also found cases of antibody levels increasing in some people, suggesting potential reinfection uh, with the virus, providing a boost to the immune system, albeit obviously still hopefully remaining asymptomatic. Pretty cool. All right, next. This is a really good article. And I want to, as far as what's wrong, with the pandemic. Now, ready? Here we go. Of lives and life years, 1918 influenza versus COVID-19. You hear that comparison a lot. And obviously, as we covered in the very beginning, uh, no, there's there's no comparison, especially since average age is affected. You know, 28 during the um, 1918 Spanish flu compared to 75. And not only that, the mix of comorbidities uh, resulting in an average life expectancy drop of 12 years, as we read earlier, compared to less than one. And the weird part about it, that's a correlation because life expectancy in the United States was going down before COVID anyways, to proceed as you obesity, diabetes, heart disease, so on and so forth. But let's go right into the individual study because he had some very, very profound quotes. So let's begin. This is not his quote, but that's how he starts. James, James started. J. J. James. That is so cool. Because the war, I cannot find it to be so bad. The death of one man, this is a catastrophe. Hundreds of thousands of deaths, that is a statistic. You know what that reminds me of? The nursing home debacle. And how they got off scot-free with that, I have no clue. For well over a year now, the world in general and the medical community in particular have been transfixed by COVID-19. From the beginning, the media has controlled the narrative and has sown a second pandemic of fear. Case in point, right there. All right, second pandemic of fear. So observationally and correlation-wise, I think it's, that's pretty much confirmed. And anxiety. Remember that? Well, we're going to get to that anxiety part because remember we covered fear-based motivation. Through sensationalism and exploitation, the principal weapons employed have been the highlighting of worst-case predictions produced by models based on multiple broad assumptions and the use of unadjusted big numbers too often presented without context or denominators to find the overall medical impact of COVID-19. The weapon of choice was reported reporting of cases per day. And you hear that often. You don't hear about hospitals filling up. You may hear like an outlier here that will throw it in. But when I, we have an opportunity to review the data, it doesn't, the, the data doesn't support the claim per se of a lot of the media outlets without regard to the presence of sign or symptoms, but rather relying on positive lab value that did not necessarily indicate infection or transmissibility. Compounding this lack of construct validity is the inability to make reliable comparisons to the lack of consistency in data collection and reporting. That's why in the beginning I showed you India in reference to the Delta variant, because if the media or your news channel, whether it be one news channel or the other, I don't care about the political affiliation, was truly of service to you, truly of service, then they would give you contrast and perspective. But it seems like they don't. And I watch them both. I watch you know, one or this that or this the other, and I go all around. And all it ears, all it ears, all it appears to be is the construct of sensationalism and fear continuously. And of course, too, there's actually no news. They would just report on what other reporters say. It's called infotainment. And no news, just a lot of infotainment. Then nothing ever gets done. A lot of complaining, but nothing ever gets done. But also the most, also to the imposition of public health interventions without regard to the validity or effectiveness of such interventions based on inferences of uniformity in the expression of the two viruses. That's what we're trying to say there. They're using the Spanish flu as a rationale 
for COVID-19. The Spanish flu, people, many more people died. Uh, and many of those individuals were much younger. Where COVID-19, they're based not upon necessarily the same mortality rate or the type of individuals which are succumbing to it, which tend to be older individuals with comorbidities. Every life is precious, don't get me wrong. But the years of life lost between an individual being 28 has a whole life ahead of them, as an individual that may be 75, uh, is a tremendous contrast that they were exploiting. Uh, they were not explaining in order to have exploitation. School and business, I mean, especially to children being hurt by this. School and business closures, stay-at-home orders, quarantine masking, etc. are almost universally imposed in the name of science. And the only outcome criterion was self-validation. Think of how much worse it would have been if we had not done such and such. This would all be well and good, save for the fact that every intervention has a cost. And as we are learning, these can be quite profound across the socioeconomic spectrum. This puts us at an ethical dilemma as health professionals. We have a duty to do all that we can to minimize the medical impacts on individuals, but just as strong a duty to minimize the overall population health impacts. If we are to optimize outcomes, we need to have some health measures that will enable at least rudimentary cost benefit analysis and provide some objective justification for interventions other than sentiment and conjecture, no matter how well intended. Remember our study last week, the one that got fact checked by the Facebook people? Um, basically, what did they do? They actually quote, uh, quoted the Geneva Convention, I believe, of 1948, in reference to doctors should be doing no harm. And so what they're doing here is they're stating, for example, yes, your medical professional may have Munchausen disorder, meaning they're inflicting, uh, they're treating you as sicker than you actually should be, per se, by restrictions, isolation, so on and so forth. And then it says, that even though your medical professional may care tremendously about you, uh, the self-validation and virtue signaling and just doing it because everyone else is doing it, yeah. All right, let's proceed forward. And the average pandemic deaths used for 1918 was 28 and COVID-19 was 75. And they extrapolated that from CDC data. And I think to conclude, just from this one aspect, I'll link to this article as well. What we can calculate with increasing accuracy over time is the negative health impacts associated with specific interventions such as school and business closures and stay-at-home motors, which have been manifested in well-documented increases in mental health issues, drug and alcohol abuse, limited access to acute and chronic medical care, lost academic years, and often severe socioeconomic injury to our most disadvantaged. All these negative health out outcomes will have some impact on overall mortality, like earning potential, you know, individual wealth, discretionary income, so on and so forth. Uh, or just being locked in the house, not exercising, uh, or loneliness. Some immediately measurable, but most in terms of future life years lost, leading to decreased individual life expectancy for a significant component of the population. If such interventions are to be used to control and mitigate future pandemics, we must be able to make a reasonable assessment and that the overall benefits achieved outweigh the cumulative harm done that we are protecting individuals' lives without undue injury to the public health. So think of it this way. If the COVID-19 reduced life expectancy by one year and with all these uh, pandemic lockdown measures, uh, for example, people's diets are worse, uh, drug abuse is, tends to be on the rise, people that have been uh, putting off cancer treatments or diagnosis, that can yield you potentially a net income or even behavioral issues to the children being brought up in an atmosphere which is not conducive to um, either psychological or physical health, especially them. How many years of life lost will be the result of what we do today? And for example, like the bus and the masks and so on and so forth, uh, I'm not even talking dysbiosis and you know, basically in uh, it can interfere with the immune system. But again, for me to proceed any forward, forward any further is interjecting publishing bias and I want to stick with the outcome that was perceived here. And to conclude, as far as the data which the individual represented, it was as follows. Spanish flu or 1918 influenza, 12 years of life lost as far as life expectancy lost 
from the 1918 influenza because the individuals being infected was 28 years of age compared to the mean uh, average year is 2020 was 75 and often correlating with other comorbidities. We're here, 1918, uh, less likely to have comorbidities. So proceed as follows. Next one, bum, 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 and I'll have the links for that as well. Long COVID and severe COVID infections associated with Epstein-Barr virus reactivation. We found over 73% of COVID-19 patients who were experiencing long COVID systems were also positive for EBV reactivation. Please keep the, the delineation of the distinction between EBV, uh, EBV infection and EBV, EBV reactivation. So you can have an EBV infection, but it's not active. So according to the researcher Gold, more than 95% of healthy adults will test positive for latent EB infection. Can you imagine if you ran your pandemic, pandemic based upon the positivity rate of, let's for example, EBV, no one would ever leave the house. But that's to give you an example between symptomatic, asymptomatic and symptomatic. And the weird part about it is obviously with individuals with long COVID, EBV is being reactivated. Now, the reason I bring this information up, it's important to bring up, is because by recognizing it potentially be an EBV reactivation or Epstein or Epstein-Barr virus, uh, it, it can yield the medical professional a greater opportunity to help the individual per se, as opposed to just treating it as this. Maybe if they treat it like this, they can get that individual to overcome long COVID. See what I mean, the hypothesis? So heading in that direction would actually be a, potentially a very, very positive uh, outcome for a large percentage of individuals, in which 95% of healthy adults, adults test positive for latent EBV infection. Is that amazing or what? And then it's reiterated again in their actual full study. Next, longitudinal serological and vaccination response to SARS-CoV-2 in professionals, uh, dental professionals, just basically, again, another confirmation or reference to natural infection, uh, given protection past nine months post-infection, at least upon uh, dentist. All right, to proceed forward, people becoming desensitized to illness, death, and research. Important, because you have to understand this from an aspect of social engineering. And basically, quote, no COVID-19 has been an indelible mark on history. Now it's time to consider what went wrong uh, during the future health crisis. Now, what they believe, and I don't know if they're right or wrong, it sounds very Machiavellian, if you're familiar with what Machiavellian is. First and foremost, we need to understand how and why scary health news lost its impact over time. See what I mean? And the author set out to test the hypothesis that the early fear-based health messages and news reports significantly motivated individuals to take actions to control the threat. Yet overexposure to the same messages desensitized people. So it was an intention not to appear to your higher Maslow's hierarchy. Their intention was to appeal to the base of Maslow's hierarchy. And that's, I think that's what drove so many people polarized. Some people were more towards the self-actualization level and other people were more towards the feed me level. You know what I mean? Our study needs to show delve deeper into how to resensitize people, which resensitize people to fear the public can motivate them to take action in the face of an ongoing emergency, testing the effectiveness of various health communication strategies, uh, which I disagree with the fear aspect because it goes back down to, where is it? Dun, 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 Here, where he said, quote, it was basically, it's a whole pandemic. The second pandemic was of fear and anxiety through sensationalism and exploitation. You see what I mean? That's how they all relate. It's kind of like the NATO and the other medication, Medunibib, uh, as far as something like that, as far as working on the protease, the protease of the SARS-2 vir uh, RNA uh, virus, whatever. Same thing with fear and anxiety. So you see how interesting the correlation is in different reports on how two different researchers can see something from totally different opposing views without hopefully being censored. But yeah, resensitize people to fear is what the individual was basically implying, I assume, unless I mistook them. But let's proceed forward. 
The study shows why second dose of COVID-19 vaccine shouldn't be skipped. Despite their outstanding efficacy, little is known as exactly this. This guy is, is wonderful. If I was ever going to get vaccinated from this vaccine, this would be the person. Because you know why? Honesty is profession. From Stanford Medicine. Despite their outstanding efficacy, little is known about how exactly RNA vaccines work. Now, what they discovered is just will blow you away. So that's why we included this article. So we probe the immune response induced by one of them into exquisite detail. I like that word. This is the first time RNA vaccines have ever been given to humans. And now, I know a lot of you watch news that starts with an animal that's related to hunting. And they said that this vaccine has been used for quite some time successfully. If I recall correctly, 874 individuals up to now in their primarily trials in reference to cancer treatment and not in, in reference to uh, pandemic mitigation or viral mitigation. So the animal news, I don't know what the other news may have said, but the animal news said a blatantly non-factual statement. This guy is honest. This is the first time RNA vaccines have been given to humans and we have no clue as to how they do what to do. Actually, I should say, except for the 874 people during the cancer trials, but I've done a man's scale, offer 95% protection against COVID-19. Now that's changed quite a bit because it depends on the variant. So it's gone down because of Delta, but this, they're still discovering how it works. Now that's not the good part. You ready? Here we go. Ta -da. Unexpectedly, uh, Pulindron, please forgive me for mispronouncing, or Pulindron said the vaccine, particularly the second dose, caused a massive mobilization of a newly discovered group of first responder cells that are normally scarce. First identified in a recent vaccine study led by the same researcher, these cells, a small subset of generally abundant cells called monocytes, that express high levels of antiviral genes, barely budge in response to actual COVID-19 infection, which is unusual because that's like that, that, that draws a delineation between the two. But the Pfizer vaccine induced them. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, we shall find out. The special group of monocytes, which are part of the innate immune system, constitute only 0.01% of all circulating blood cells prior to vaccination. But after the second Pfizer vaccine shot, the numbers expanded 100 fold to account for a full 1% of all blood cells. In addition, their disposition became less inflammatory, but more intensely antiviral. They seem uniquely capable of providing broad protection against diverse viral infections. So, we don't know how they are. They work, the vaccines. The guy's honest. and But this guy, of all people, as individuals, sorry, I apologize. It could be a, a female as well. I don't know. Um, this is, I'm just, that's, that's called I'm being, I'm being prejudiced and that was bias. And so basically, however, though, just the same, the researcher, whomever they may be, uh, Bali Pulindron, uh, the wonderful individual, first person to actually look to see if exactly how it works, which I would like to see that done while it was in tri the trials, wouldn't that have been cool? So all of a sudden these monocytes account for 1% of all blood cells, going from 0.01 to 1%, a hundredfold increase. Whether it's good or bad, obviously in fighting the virus, most likely good, but still, that's incredible. And yet, this vaccine's have been for a while, and we're still learning how it works. But just the same, the individual is great. And again, I appreciate the research from this researcher and I love the honesty and it's so refreshing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, and again, our data sources, uh, just a heads up, healthdata.gov and of course, Outbreak Info. We're gonna have to go through this real fast. What I'll do is I'll go through the VARES database real fast and then we'll have to call that a night because it is 3.10 a.m. But let us proceed as follows. You ready? Here it goes. Do, 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 All right, uh, so. These all require verification. Again, the caveat, I showed you the various uh, disclaimer. I'll just use theirs. All right, per se. Uh, Bell's palsy, they close that up. No, it's not closing, who cares? All right, Bell's palsy reactions, we know. We record thrombocytopenia reactions at 593. Let's just get the information as, as we set. All right, thrombosis, 2,476 potential reactions. 
uh, COVID-19 illness by age, 10,402 reports, median age right there. We notice those breakthroughs. Uh, certain individuals, again, uh, you have to watch your duplicates. This is what's getting a lot of people hit. There's again these huge death tolls. And, but you have to understand certain various IDs, one person may fill out 21 reports. And these are all, for example, multiple reports. So that artificially inflates the database if you're going, oh, I just want to, I'm going to do a length of the database to determine the amount that died. Well, that Y, for example, in that column of death, for example, that bo or Boolean one or whatever it is can be repeated 21 times and give you a false elevated uh, death toll, which is you don't want to do that because that will disrupt your credibility or at least not credibility as far as being honest, but credibility as being effective as far as pulling the data. And that can make you dangerous as well. First, see it as follows. Do, 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 do. All right, reaction reports. Saw that reaction reports by age. Uh, reported mortality that requires verification is at 5,441. There's your ages, as you see down the line. All right, varies by weeks. Look at the reports. All of a sudden, boom. Now, remember, less people were vaccinated. But also we had this massive drop. It is weird this prior week, everything from TikTok, which I get all my news from TikTok. Uh, basically, all of a sudden you had this massive vaccine push, massive vaccine push. Uh, and um, But then what's really weird is the drop in the number of people being vaccinated. So they got to rethink their strategy. I don't think the fear strategy is working too well. Uh, COVID mortality. I don't think any government should be have their job as far as a bureaucracy's job is to scare the life out of the population. I don't think that should be a motivation motivation factor of a free or relatively free society. Uh, COVID mortality to various reports. Remember, we had less vaccines, but it's it's tend to bounce off. So these are the uh, the reports of mortality to various. These are the reports of mortality from COVID, and that's up to that date. All right, and we go down the line. Do, 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 scroll down, uh, scroll down. I'm moving really fast. Uh, let's see, did that thing, thing go away? I'm not gonna, I'm worried the computer's gonna freeze. All right, reactions reported. 418,778 versus 57,115 from 2020, uh, 2020, compared to the 2021. There's our bar chart. All right, going down real fast. I regret I don't have more time, otherwise I would. Our, this is our, our word cloud. That's the most common uh, report, as you see fit, as you see fit, as you see there. Top 30 reported symptoms. Let's make this a little smaller. All right, there we go. All right, and let's make, you can see right there, these are the top 30 reported systems, of course, um, from individuals that unfortunately passed. We must have skipped a part. Yeah, we did, we bounced when we hit that. Uh, make the screen smaller. So the most no common ones from those which reported uh, uh, that have passed away, COVID-19, which is really weird. We know there's breakthrough cases, but I didn't expect to see it so high. And here too, if you take these two combined, uh, you're, you're going to be at the second most common cause of mortality or relation to mortality in the VAERS database. All right. Then we go to reports by days. That's the lot numbers with the greatest reactivity uh, on a numerical basis, on a percentage basis. This is in children. Most common reports in children. It's the word cloud. It just comes out the way it is. I don't, I don't adjust the word cloud. Trust me, I don't have time to put these letters in. Chest pain, which is really weird. It's dizziness, fatigue, uh, headache, fatigue, then chest pain, which again, the symptoms are different than basically from, that's why myocarditis is so weird because it also, you have all these symptoms pop up between the age of 55 and 60. Then you have myocarditis is like reported heavily and 20 and younger. All right, we don't know why. Uh, vaccine adverse reports compared to vaccinations. So I knew it was gonna go up higher because the people that you're vaccinating now are more reluctant. Uh, and so they're more likely probably to be angry and report a, a reaction. Uh, days from reaction report, da, da, da. let's see anything else on here. No, we just go down there. All right, I'm gonna go here to mutations. No, let's go here. 
That's our zip file drive size of the adverse event reports right there, 2021, compared to all the other years. This gives you an idea of the toll that the CDC researchers have to work with. And yeah, obviously it was hard enough working on adverse event reports when it was at this level. Now that's at this level, wow, that's going to require a lot of people to research that. So that when you get those IE safety signals, per se, as we mentioned in the disclaimer, uh, yeah, you got a lot of work to do uh, as far as that. That's that's uh, that's incredible. All right, that's real fast. Hospital occupancy. I just want to show you California, just in case I try to scare you with the Delta variant. There is a little bit of an uptick and in a lot of the areas, but not really dramatic. Nothing that's like, you know, the hospitals are, are packed. I'm looking at the... I mean, that's the most current one. If I look at, for example, the um, COVID rebuild, for example, here, which you look at all the states. I mean, if you look at it, that's inpatient beds uh, with COVID compared to total inpatient beds. I'll scroll that a little slower. I'm not seeing a dramatic impact. As you can see, going through the line as a speed through. And there's deaths per 100,000. Yeah, there was, it just, again, doesn't mean things can't turn around. You. I can't, I can't, you never can speak in absolutes and there's always going to be uncertainty, but probability and possibility. The probability of something getting worse right now after the massive exposure and everything else like that and the variance is probably uh, less, let's put it that way. Is it possible it can get worse? Yeah, without a doubt, anything's possible. But, you know, probability um, is being, is getting lower and lower each day, let's put it that way. All right, and then what else? Uh, Don Mock, that's Barney Carl. I really am out of time. I did so much I want to cover just to show you. But mutations, India, for example. Uh, and I'll show you one last thing, and then we'll call it a night. India, for example, fully vaccinated people. This is from when we're looking at the mutation levels, and this is the population. Total COVID vaccinations, it's like a dent in the pan. That's what I was trying to show you, like 6.6% .6 vaccinated. Uh, new vaccinations, positivity rate was already going down. And then that, and then cases smooth, so on and so forth. But here, right here, this is a correlation chart. Let's see if I, I'll, I'm not going to go any further, but this is a correlation chart between um, tests and cases. So what the implication is or what it's being implied or the correlation is the more tests there are, the more cases there are. The question is, are there more cases because, is there more cases because of more tests or is there more tests because of more cases? Again, that's hyperbole. That's for you to make the determination. And if you want to look where the United States is, they're on the positive correlation of about 0.8, 0.85. And so that's a strong correlation where other countries, uh, the, the, the correlation, obviously, is actually negative in some aspects, but fairly weak. All right, let's cover what we covered real fast, and then I got to say goodnight. And we covered as follows, information sources, outbreak info. We utilize healthdata.gov for our hospital occupancy. Uh, we use our world and data for a lot of the data, which I didn't have a chance to show you, but at least as far as the Delta variant impact. And, of course, VARES, which we use as a disclaimer, because we're going to the CDC, that all reports are not verified and they need to be verified. All right, studies we covered. We studied backwards. We are going to study shows second dose of COVID-19. Really interesting article as far as 1% of your blood cells become monocytes after in, uh, inoculation with the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, desensitized to fear-based health messaging. Well, maybe we should try different messages. All right, longitudinal serological vaccination. Yep, we know that. All right, pathogens, Epstein-Barr, quite interesting. I like to be able to help a lot of people the best I could. And if someone has long COVID, uh, maybe the EBV should be treated, as we discussed. A wonderful article from the Society of Disaster Medicine and Public Health on how the uh, the narrative is being uh, abused, potentially. Uh, COVID-19 antibodies persist last nine months of infection, one of many, showing that natural infection kicks butt. It exists in, obviously, natural infection kicks butt, but you wonder how much of the uh, credit is being given to vaccine when it actually has been primarily asymptomatic exposure. Existing drugs shown to inhibit SARS-CoV-2. Again, that medication is 
been used for quite some time and it is called metinib. Where'd it go? Metinibib. And so basically it is masinibib. Masinibib. Masinib. Well, I'm not going to bore you repeating it over and over again until I get the pronunciation down, but if any of the researchers watch this video, please feel free to correct me. I would be grateful. All right. Uh, CDC, mask use. There we go. All right. That's the CDC information. I'm a, I'm a, you can't fact check me on the CDC because if the CDC say mask uh, limited in its effect, then don't get mad at me. All right. Here it goes. How readily does COVID-19 spread in school buses? No, looks like not at all. All right, here goes. Traditional nautokinase. I hope this helps a lot of people. That's really, really cool to incorporate into a diet because, again, the protease. And the protease seems to have a pretty common effect with basically mass it in the bib. Well, you know what I'm talking about. All right. Uh, patient case strongly suggests COVID uh, Bell's palsy. We noticed that. And we went through the chart there. And we notice there is a lot of reactions, uh, which are basically there as reference to Bell's palsy. We go all the way to the top. Nah, it's not going. Who cares? You know what I mean. All right. And then basically, yes, I was fact checked and they, they're valid on the point. That's why I put the various uh, thing there. Uh, artificial intelligence. People keep on telling you chip, chip, chip or magnetize, whatever it is. Just tell them that's... So yesterday, it's not required. All they guys have to do is bounce radio waves off of people and from miles and miles away, or radio waves, 5G waves. And they can determine the emotions of individuals and actually, actually, obviously, such so well, they can actually pick the individuals out and uh, report them to the police because they're thinking bad thoughts. All right, and so Minority Report. And so COVID-19, uh, our world and data. And thank you, thank you, thank you for all the researchers, data, the various data. And yes, I do thank the CDC people because they do the database, even though sometimes it is misinterpreted or misconstrued. But as always, oh, wow, we're almost like over, over like an hour and seven minutes. But thank you, friends. Good night. And I look forward to see you all once again next week. See you next time. Bye.